Welcome to the uh, last colloquium of our Center for Global Ethics and Politics at the Ralph Bunch Institute. Um, we're uh, really thrilled with uh, our speaker today, but before I say that, I want to um, remind you that we always have a fantastic reception after the talk, after the uh, talk in the Q&A. Then we go down to the fifth, fifth floor at the Ralph Bunch Institute for teaching and Power three of us. We have a reception there. So you're all invited to that. And the Zoom people, unfortunately, maybe next time. Um, so uh, I would like to um, take this opportunity to just introduce my colleague, uh, Matt Lindauer, who is uh, sort of an acquaintance, friend, whatever, with our speaker, and he will introduce the speaker. So thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited about it. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to introduce Olufemi Taiwo, Associate Professor of Philosophy and African Studies at Georgetown University. Um, you might have noticed that just this year he uh, wrote and published two books, Reconsidering Reparations and Elite Capture. And here he's moving towards some work on freedom. The title of his talk today is Subjective Security. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Taiwo. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt and Carol and Patricia for putting all this together. Um, I'm really glad to get to talk philosophy at all, um, but I'm especially grateful to get to talk about this subject. Um, it's kind of my philosophical white whale, what's freedom, right? That's, you know, everybody's got their question, I guess, or a set of questions, and that's mine. That's the one close to my heart. So the title of this talk, Subjective Security, is uh, one of the components of my attempt to answer this big philosophical question, um, what's freedom? Um, so I want to start by just saying um, in I guess the least defensive, least careful way, um, the least varnished way, what it is that I'm trying to explain. What's my commitment? Um, and my basic commitment is um, this sentence. I think that there's a sense in which a person needs to feel secure to be free. And, you know, feel is a very squarely word. You know, freedom is the thing we're trying to define, you know, blah, blah. Um, there'll be lots of things to poke at. Um, but this is the this is the goalpost that I've set for myself. I think this is true. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why I why it is that I think it's true, whether it's true. Um, and the approach that I'm taking to doing that is just trying to develop, you know, trying to give a positive case for a view of freedom that involves this claim. Um, so a Weigh in starting from some meta ethics. Um, broadly, the way that I'm thinking about freedom, um, the way that I'm trying to end up defining it is to think of freedom as um, an arrangement problem. Um, the problem of freedom um, or what freedom turns out to be has something deeply to do with not just the fact that there are agents out there, people with the kinds of capacities that would allow them to lead a life that could succeed or fail to be free, um, but something to do with the particular, um, perhaps necessary, perhaps contingent ways that those people relate to each other and the world around them. Um, so there is a kind of abstract meta-ethical problem of right that involves this arrangement way of thinking about freedom. And there is a much more concrete, not obviously related uh, political conception of freedom that has to do with whether or not you have been colonized by some entity out there. Um, and it's not always taken to be obvious that there is a relationship between those two um, ways of thinking about freedom, those two problems for freedom, those two valences of freedom, you might say. Um, but I think that there is one. Um, so I, I may return to this. Uh, there's a bunch of commitments that I have. Um, 
I just put this on the screen for a way of um, getting as much of the view out there as you care to engage with. But the bit in red is the thing that I think is important for today. All right. So while I have this arrangement view of freedom, which um, unsurprisingly is going to turn out to be a social structural view of what freedom is, I nevertheless think of freedom as a personal achievement. And this gets me in trouble with my uh, fellow uh, crotchety, somewhat orthodox minded Marxists, because um, maybe you think freedom should just should just be social structural. Um, if we're looking for anything beyond the social structural, we have uh, lapsed into bourgeois idealism or something. Um, maybe that's true, um, but also maybe not. I think I think there is something personal about freedom. There is something to the more individually focused ways of talking about freedom that are more common in, for example, liberal traditions of thought broadly construed. Um, and so this is a commitment that I have, and maybe you'll see why in a second. Let's see. I think that coexistence needs explaining. Um, A.J. Julius, another philosopher, um, another political philosopher also thinks so. And the basic setup to the problem of arrangement and the way of thinking about freedom that I think emerges out of framing agency and people's agential activity in this basic way um, might go something like this. So one view of agency, a candidate view of agency or a candidate set of views of agency is that it's a capacity. Um, because we have certain kinds of uh, capabilities, maybe the ability to reflect on our behavior, maybe the ability to endorse the activity that we carry out, maybe the ability to guide the activity by rational, um, by our rational capacities. There are different ways of going about this. Um, but what it comes to that we are agents, that we have agency is that we have this capacity. Um, and so you can imagine a view, in fact, some people I think have a view on which we just have agency categorically. We are the sort of beings that are agential. Um, and social contingent things like history and where you find yourself in history, where you find yourself in the world, um, only bear on to what extent you're able to use your agency or what to what extent you're able to exercise your agency, but they don't fundamentally bear on what your agency is at bottom um, or whether or not you have it. Um, but I think even people with such a strong view would nevertheless, con nevertheless concede the second major bullet point on the screen, which is um, whatever it comes to that agency is not a capacity that we just have in a metaphysical sense, but a capacity that we exercise, that we use in the world for us to live agentially. Um, it matters how things are arranged um, and things get non-categorical real quick. What stuff can you actually do in the world? Well, it depends uh, what the world is like. Um, there are many traditions of philosophy that have thought in very different ways about what aspects of the world matter to determining what your agency looks like and what its exercise looks like. Um, I think this cuts across a lot of political traditions. Um, but at least one problem, and the problem that has... Uh, been a jumping off point for many ways of thinking about freedom is uh, what you could call the problem of other people. Because if I am an agent, but I'm not the only agent, uh, then there's other stuff out there in the world um, capable of some of the stuff that I'm capable of, engaging in purposive action, uh, willing things, if you like the content language, um, all of that good stuff. Um, and in particular, kind of jumping off the Kantian way of framing this thing, um, A.J. Julius considers the problem of right as um, the external, external, um, in this case, to the will of the agent, um, external incompatibilities between the possible actions of embodied persons. Um, unfortunately, we are not just floating uh, noumena. We have bodies and we exist in time and space with some of these other agents and some of the particular ends that those other agents might adopt uh, could conflict in some way with the ends that we adopt. So um, from that standpoint, there, 
emerges a particular desideratum, a thing we might want out of um, thinking about um, agency, and in particular, thinking about agency in the way that comes with discussions of freedom. Um, what ways of being agents around other agents might be the kinds of ways of being around them that would preserve um, the thing about our agency that's supposed to make us free? One potential desideratum is independence, that all the space we might ever occupy as we act for our purposes and all the external resources we might devote to them fall under a single law of traffic. Um, so um, if you've read your Kant and you recognize the you know, kingdom of ends kind of thought, um, that shouldn't be terribly surprising. And I'm just gonna note one more time that um, the law of traffic in the sort of Kantian flavored language is very abstract. But there is a very concrete political tradition of actual problems devoted to um, this kind of thinking about at least the political version of whatever the word freedom refers to. Um, in particular, um, it's a way of talking about freedom that um, you find in anti-colonial movements. Um, and Cabral is just my, my favorite guy on that side of things on every other side of things, he's just the best. All right, so what is the problem of other people? What problem do they pose to my freedom, your freedom, everybody's freedom? Maybe it's just contingent. Maybe the um, problem of right or the problem of other people is just the fact that I might want to do X and you might want to do Y and we might, fill out the particulars of my xing and your ying in ways that um, are purely contingently incompatible. Um, I want to use the car to go to the movies. You want to use the car to go to the mall. Um, we both want to do that at 7 a.m. and the mall and the movies are in different directions, right? That kind of problem. Um, there's also a sort of deeper problem that your agency might pose. Um, the thing you want, the whying that you will, might not simply be going to the mall whilst I wish to go to the movies, things that are at least in principle, you could imagine a world where both of those things could happen. Um, but the thing you might want might be the frustration of my ends. I, you want to prevent Femi from going to the movies or you want to control Femi in a much deeper way. You want to dominate me or put me in a cage or um, put me under your imperial control, perhaps. Um, that is uh, a kind of deeper problem. Um, and so all of these moves, I think, um, I hope should be familiar, um, but I'm just reposing these basic problems of freedom in arrangement terms. Because again, I understand freedom this way. Um, there's something about how the world is actually set up that um, makes your, the things that you will, a potential problem for me. And the reason why I think of even these ways of talking about freedom as arrangement problems is uh, quite simple. Um, right now, perhaps some of you um, do want to prevent me from going to the movies, right? That might be a desire that some of you have. Maybe you don't like me very much. Um, maybe you just don't like anyone very much. Maybe you hate movies and don't think anyone should go to them. Um, but this becomes a problem for me in a material sense in the sense of me actually going to the movies um, only if you find yourself with the power or practical means of preventing or complicating how I get to the movies. If you find yourself in possession of my car or my subway pass or whatever. Um, so all that is to just say that um, the desires, the things that you might will be they for my benefit or for my detriment or neither, are related to my practical activity through the practical structure that relates us. 
Um, and hopefully that's clear, um, but I'm happy to say more in Q and A. All this is building to uh, this simple thing. Uh, this is the kind of view that I have, freedom is self-determination view. Um, I think that thinking of the problem of freedom on arrangement terms fits this definition of, or this particular approach to thinking about freedom. And I think that this particular approach to thinking about freedom is um, potentially overlapping with some of these other ones, but I think distinct in some ways. Um, and I am going to try to say some things about what the world looks like if this is your view of freedom. This is what the world looked like to Carolina Maria de Jesus. And I think this was her view of freedom. Um, and hopefully this kind of concrete example will put some teeth on the sorts of contrasts I'm hoping to draw. So in 1958, she's living in the Canin de Favela. favela. Um, it was the 70th anniversary of the formal abolition of slavery in Brazil. And she spent that day, like many other days, uh, trying to survive. She sent her children to beg neighbors for food. And she described this struggle in a peculiar way. She described it as fighting present day slavery. Um, it was the 70th anniversary. Um, so slavery was on mind. She chose her words carefully um, and with intent and with, I think, something like the version of freedom that I'm trying to pitch to you all. Um, and just for the sake of having a contrast to see what's at stake in thinking of freedom in this way, um, here's an essay on freedom that most of us probably at least have heard of, if not read, um, that I quite like by Isaiah Berlin. He gave a lecture outlining two concepts of liberty. Um, I'm just taking it on faith that liberty and freedom are interchangeable, and I have no doubt that 50% of you will have an argument for why they are not, um, and I can't wait to talk about it. But um, positive liberty for Berlin um, involves something like self-mastery. I don't think that's the problem with the day that Carolina Maria DJ Seuss sense spends trying to find food. Um, she exerted self-control over her impulses to make the decisions that she made and to execute the decisions that she made. And I also don't think it was, um, it fits the way that Berlin talked about negative liberty, um, at least not squarely. Um, there was, You know, we can argue about to what extent structural coercion is similar or equivalent to the kind of coercion that somebody putting a gun in your face exerts upon you. Um, but there was no gun in her face on this day, right? There was no obvious person to person kind of direct interpersonal interference telling her you must send your kids to go ask neighbors for food. She decided to do so. And you know, arguably had good reason to decide to do that. What I do think was missing from her day is what she thought was missing from her day, which was um, a particular kind of security. Um, we could call it material security. I don't totally need that for today, but the background facts about the social structure and the place in that social structure where um, G.J. Zeus finds herself, um, undermines an interpretation of the very control over her agential, agential capacities that she's exercising um, as free actions. Um, she decided to send her kids to beg for food, um, but nevertheless, um, that was an unfree decision even though it was a decision, even though it was hers, and even though no particular person compelled her to make that decision. Um, so these are the kinds of moves that you would make to motivate a structural view of freedom. And there is a structural view of at least the world out there. And that is, of course, the immortal science materialism. 
So what's materialism? Um, well, materialism broadly approach to philosophy beginning with um, a basic kind of fundamental uh, starting point that says, here's an important thing about the world and history and the stuff that happens in history. We were embodied creatures. We have biological imperatives and needs. We're this before we are anything else. And so if we want to explain historical events, we might have a special eye towards the kinds of social relations that have to do with how we meet those bodily needs. That is, of course, production and reproduction, which is the activity that we do to make sure that we can continue to produce. So if you want to explain why the world's doing the stuff that's doing, here are things you might look at. And here's a story about why you might look at that particular subdomain of human activity to explain what's happening. So with all this in mind, um, we can see why you might want a structural view of freedom. This is the motivation for um, the social structural version of thinking about freedom. And all this answers why you might want a social structural view of freedom. It doesn't answer why freedom would be a personal achievement. Right? Whatever it is about the world economy that explains why Carolina Maria de Jesus um, has to spend her day in the way that she has to spend it, those are things presumably that she's not in a position to change. Um, and it's the very fact that she's not in the position to change those things that explains why she explains her day's activity in the way that she does. A day's worth of unfreedom, a day's worth of present day slavery. Um, it seems that there's no option for her to do a thing that would count as free living. And so why is it that despite starting with a story like this, I nevertheless end up um, thinking about the individual aspects of freedom. So I moved to that by um, reminding you all of something that uh, I didn't emphasize the first time that we saw this slide. Um, the positive commitment of freedom of self-determination is determining the course of our own lives. It could be that a certain kind of social structure would be a necessary condition for that, but not a sufficient condition. It could be that the world has to be arranged in a certain way um, for anyone to have the opportunity to live a free life, um, but the world being arranged in that way may not in and of itself decide whether or not our lives are free. And so um, in with a cape flies the view. So what would be a view that unites the social structural things that we might want from an account of freedom, if any of the proceeding has been in any way persuasive, um, but that nevertheless um, makes room for the various ways that we might mess up even after the proverbial revolution or the actual revolution, whatever. Um, hopefully that is autobiography. Um, that is the view that I'm driving towards. And one of the things that would be missing from a purely social structural account of freedom, I think, would be the contribution that subjective security makes to freedom. So just a brief statement of the autobiographical view of freedom um, or something that is at the very least very representative of the autobiographical view of freedom before we get into the particular subjective aspects of this way of thinking about security and about freedom. So um, what would national liberation, again, I'm treating as interchangeable with freedom, what would freedom at a national level be? You could restate it as. Foundation for national liberation rests in the inalienable right of every people to have their own history, right? Um, so their own history, their own story to be the not merely the protagonists, but author, also the authors of their lives is another way you could describe this. 
Um, and one of the things Cabral stresses that this would have to involve is the liberation of the process of development of the national productive forces. Um, so, I mean, socialism, basically. Um, you, this is very recognizable, Marxist thought. Um, but I think it also involves this personal achievement stuff. So all of that has been a very long setup. So here's where the view fits. Um, there has to be objective security. Maybe that's the stuff that would happen if the national productive forces were liberated. Um, there's much to say about that. But for today, um, what I would like to say is the contribution that subjective security makes. And let's see, I'm about halfway through the time. So subjective security. Great, we're here. Uh, a reminder, uh, basic thing that I think security um, with respect to basic material needs like food, water, shelter is one of freedom's most important building blocks. Um, I think something like this falls out of a basic materialist commitment. Um, but I want to say a bit more. Why is security in general important to freedom? Um, the problem of rights doesn't mention security, at least by name. Um, most of the meta ethics, at least most of the meta ethics written in the last 200 years, although you get a very different picture of things if you're looking at um, political philosophy of Hobbes or Locke or that era. Uh, but most recent stuff does not mention this concept. Um, so why does it matter? Well, the way that I'm thinking about security, um, again, straying into metaethics land for just a little bit, um, but I'm thinking about it as a glue that holds the parts of processes together. And this is just a view of what action is like. Um, and of course, I also think it's one of the things that we need to be free. Um, but why subjective security? So if our actions are processual and we expect the rest of the action to happen while we're doing any particular part of the action, um, that might be a reason why something like objective security is required. It has to be true um, that I can do all the parts of getting from here to the movies. Otherwise, I will only succeed at getting to the parking garage. Okay, fine. Maybe that's a good view of action. But why would I have to believe in my security? Um, the security of the kinds of actions that I might want to take. What's the role for how I think about the world, how I think about the processes I'm engaged in and that others are engaged in around me? What does that have to do with freedom and with politics in general? So uh, here's a historical little story that I think about a lot. 1790, um, French colonist, planter, slave owner, um, Le Bar says, there's no movement among our Negroes. They don't even think of it. They are very tranquil and obedient. If you know a little bit about history, um, you might recognize the date and realize this is among the most incorrect things that has ever been said by any human being. <laughs> um, this happens, of course, the right before the greatest worker uprising in history, the enslaved workers of Haiti, destroying the racialized chattel slavery system that existed on the then colony of Saint-Domingue, starting the national independence of Haiti, et cetera, et cetera. Um, hopefully as recognizable. Um, why do I think about a story like that when I'm thinking about this abstract thing like security? Um, well, Production and reproduction, um, the kinds of activity that materialists think in a special way about, but activity in general are 
temporally extended processes. This is something that um, philosophers of action like uh, Michael Brotman um, have paid some particular attention to in recent decades. It matters for how we think about what agency is that the activities that agents engaged in are temporally extended, but not just temporally extended, but extended in other ways that are relevant for thinking about freedom in either the uh, meta-ethical or political senses. The parts of processes are extended across time, but they're also extended across space, and they are extended across persons. The action of me cooking you a meal um, consists of smaller individual actions, me chopping the vegetables, me putting them on the skillet, me setting the table. Um, some of those are mine, like the ones I just listed. Some smaller individual, individual actions are yours. You're getting in your car or getting on public transportation, coming to my house, you eating the food that I have cooked for the meal that we're planning to share. Each of these parts depends on the other parts for their justification, but also for their basic constitution. The fact that you later come over to my house and sit down and eat the food is part of what makes it good that I am now chopping vegetables. Um, it is also part of what makes it true that my chopping vegetables right now is an act of cooking us dinner. The fact that we eat dinner later. All right, so hopefully some familiar stuff. So security in general is um, the glue that holds these pro parts of the processes together. Um, it is not simply the sort of, I'll not say that. Let me move on. So let me say this instead. What has to be true about the world, about how the world is arranged for the actions of chopping and frying and table setting that I take to make sense? Another way to put that is what am I relying on when I am chopping and setting the table? I'm relying on some stuff about you, um, your willingness and ability to eat the food. I'm relying um, on some stuff about other people that public transportation will continue to run, allowing you to get from your house to mine, or that traffic will not be backed up. Um, I'm relying on some stuff about the world, that there won't be a freak hurricane, making it impossible for you to come over here, et cetera, et cetera. All right. um, so you could put, you could think of security as just a way of talking about this schedule of reliances that I might have. And you could think of objective security as whatever facts about the world make these good reliances to make. And you could think about subjective security as my actual relying on these things. Um, so one thing you might think, um, perhaps if you are, say, an analytic philosopher, is, wow, these, these things could come apart. It might be that you rely on some stuff that isn't really true about how the world works. You make guesses about what will or will not happen that are evidence-free or um, respond to evidence in the wrong way, and so on and so forth. Um, and so how could such an unreliable thing, subjective security, be important to freedom, which we might suspect has to do with really tracking how the world is. Um, and that is certainly the sort of thing that is relevant in the Labar case. Um, this guy just turned out to be wrong about what the world was like. Um, but I think it matters exactly what Labar is getting wrong. And um, what Labar could have been getting right. Um, so what is it that explains Labar's subjective security? Maybe it's something entirely idiosyncratic, something personal and psychological, um, exceptional naivete or recklessness or inattention to the world around him. Um, but maybe his very subjective condition of relying on the world and the way that he 
um, to continue to be the way that it had been for two centuries before 1790. Um, Maybe there's something extra subjective that explains this subjective condition he finds himself in. And those things I would think are things about how the social structure of Saint-Domingue operated. The um, slave patrols, the racial ideology, the sorts of things that existed, not simply to make it the case that rebellions were hard to do, but also to build the kind of subjective character in would-be settlers that would be compatible with them living in this environment and being settlers, being um, slave owners, and so on and so forth. There were entire sets of activity by the French Empire that existed to create this kind of subjective condition in La Barre. And if we think seriously about Labar's condition, um, as hilariously wrong as Labar turned out to be about what parts of the world were reliable, we might well wonder if we are ourselves not hilariously wrong about at least some of the things that we rely on about the world. An objective explanation of Labar's subjective security um, would call into attention some particular aspects of the social system that um, seem to play a role in why Labar operates the plantation and thus produces the profit that the plantation produces, um, but don't in and of themselves produce profit in the direct way that growing sugarcane produces profit, but nevertheless seem, if I'm right, to be part of the story of what was going on in Saint Domingue? So these things, uh, the slave patrols, um, the strike breaking apparatuses of this, of these centuries of Atlantic history turn out to be important to explaining the politics of this time period. Um, perhaps for slightly different reasons than maybe a more orthodox materialist account might um, sideline in favor of thinking about the profit of these industries more squarely. So let's see, how much more do I have time for? Let me get this on the table. Nowadays, we talk about trauma a lot at least if you are addicted to social media like I am. Um, and you might wonder why. It's actually somewhat new as far as um, research goes. It was the tail end of the 19th century where we get the beginnings of um, what you could think of as the sort of modern psychological theory of trauma. And there's a actually very interesting story about the initial research um, where Charcot, Janet, and Freud actually pretty much um, crack the case about the basic psychological aspects of what trauma is, but they unfortunately for them do so by revealing high levels of childhood sex abuse in uh, French bourgeois communities. And so mysteriously, they end up disavowing their psychological findings, um, which ends up setting the psychological study of trauma back uh, half a century or so. There is a surge in interest in the aftermath of the First World War, where a huge proportion of the combat casualties are from people who are not physically touched by a bullet or exploding shell. Um, at first, they tried to um, blame the kind of concussive shock waves of exploding shells, um, causing um, psychological symptoms in people who were near battlefields that uh, very clearly turned out to not explain very much. Um, but in the Vietnam War era, 
another political movement ended up producing the kind of research that would explain what the combat veterans of World War I were dealing with as other people who had experienced violence um, in the women's liberation movement and in the anti-war movement of combat veterans from Viet the Vietnam War um, ended up having similar symptoms. And psychologists like Dr. Herman, who you see on the screen, ended up um, synthesizing these experiences into what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is um, the kind of modern origins of how it is that we talk about trauma these days. I want to skip to Let's do this. So we find, um, or Herman finds rather, that the people who had the worst psychological outcomes after experiencing um, the levels of trauma that these pioneering researchers were finding in combat veterans of the Vietnam War, and also finding in domestic violence survivors. Um, they're finding that the people who had the worst and the people who had the best psychological outcomes had certain kinds of things in common. They responded to their experiences in certain patterned ways. Um, so one study of uh, veterans who didn't develop PTSD, even though they were experienced heavy combat exposure showed um, what Herman calls a characteristic triad of active task-oriented coping strategies, um, strong sociability, and internal locus of control. Um, so that is to say that um, the people who not only were individually task-minded, but who were task-minded in a collaborative way, working with other people to get through these hellish conditions and who felt internally that they were able to do so, that the decisions that they made in their um, horrible, uncontrollable circumstances nevertheless had some meaning, locus of control. Those are the people who had the best outcomes with respect to trauma. The people who had the worst outcomes, the people who froze or dissociated um, and had worse disorders later, were the people who tried to go it alone, the so-called Rambos, um, people who plunged into impulsive and isolated action and not affiliated with others. Um, similar in um, the case of women who experienced gender-based violence, um, the people who also used task active strategies um, had better psychological outcomes. Um, and actually, there's one other thing I should say about this slide. Um, they had better psychological outcomes, regardless of whether or not they, quote unquote, succeeded or failed, you know, whether or not they were able to fend off an attacker or whether they weren't able to fend off an attacker. The attempt to fend off an attacker made somebody was psychologically protective. Herman sums this up this way. Uh, the core experiences of psychological trauma are disempowerment and disconnection from others. Uh, recovery, therefore, is based upon the empowerment of sur the survivor and the creation of new connections, she says. I think drawing off the last slide, I want to play up the subjective element of um, the sense of disempowerment. Right. Um, the combat veterans who had a strong internal locus of control, um, the gender-based violence survivors who, um, who fought um, and who used task-oriented strategies of other kinds. Um, in both cases, it seems irrespective of whether or not they were on that day successful. These are the people who you know, this subjective sense of disempowerment seems a part of the core experiences of psychological trauma and this particular kind of disempowerment, at least according to Herman. 
I think that the basic thing going on here um, shows us both, I think, the promise and limits of a social structural view on what it is that we have to do to be free people. I think that the possibility of being a free person is won and lost at the social structural level. And I think this is the basic kind of materialist approach to thinking about history and politics. We are material beings, the actions that we take to fulfill our material needs happens, happen at scales much larger than individual agency or choices. Um, and the scale of systems of production, um, systems of distribution, capitalism, et cetera, are wildly beyond the ability of individual people to control, even most collectives of people to control. And because of that, you might think that that realm of analysis is the only place where we're going to find things that are relevant to characterizing freedom in the ethical sense or in the political sense. I think that is a mistake. Um, I think one thing we should be particularly humbled by living in the circumstances that we are now is as large as the scale of human activity is, is dwarfed by the scale of existence. In the final analysis, the world revolves around neither individual beliefs nor the logic of capital accumulation the earth in fact revolves around the sun. The natural world, the sky, the rain, the migratory patterns of Buffalo, the viruses, um, I think these play a role in deciding what our lives are like in no less serious of a way than human activity at some small scale or large scale. And the problem of other people, whether at the scale of individuals on a Kantian Euclidean plane or collectives of groups in geopolitical contests over natural resources, um, I think that starting the question of what political freedom is, what ethical freedom is, what agency is, from a view that is narrowly focused on the problem of other people um, leaves out a bunch of problems, like how we're going to live in a world that is much hotter, um, that is undergoing a mass extinction event, you know, whether or not, um, quite besides the question of what those levels of destruction have to do with Jeff Bezos's net worth or whatever. Um, and I think that this is not a move away from materialist thought, but rather a move, I guess you could say, back into materialist thought, because the basic conception is that we are a material being. Um, the basic materialist conception is that we are material beings that have to do work on the world and in the world in order to meet our material needs. And that activity actually is production, which is the central materialist thought. So, All that is to say that whatever can be won on the level of organizing human social structural activity in good ways and bad ways, whatever can be won is not yet equal, I think, to the question of what freedom could possibly be in a world that we couldn't control even if we did have the best political system and the best social structure. S much sooner than we think, we'll be asking basic questions about how we are going to secure ourselves 
and our basic needs. And these will not be questions that we can answer purely by answering which people have the best political ideas about how the world should be structured and which people have the best moral relationship to other human beings. They will be questions about our needs in and of themselves. There will be questions about what are good energy systems and reliable energy systems. There will be questions about what are good public health practices, so on and so forth, the questions that we're all living through right now. That is not to say, of course, that politics is relevant. Um, I think um, the success of popular movements to answer the problems of other people as well as the problems of the natural world will be decided by popular movements like all the rest have been. Um, but it does allow us to think differently maybe about what the target is. Um, I'm actually going to stop there. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, this was really interesting. I wanted to, um, oh, sorry, my name is Jordan. I'm a student at Rutgers. Um, and I wanted to see what you thought of, of I guess, this, this idea. Another way to move into materialist thought might be to look at how change happens on the structural level and it being, I think this is sort of, this is something close to at least what you were saying and its connection to a sense of security or agency, um, a locus of control. And one way to think about this, so I used to be an organizer and something we'd say a lot is you have a duty to believe that you will win um, or that our success depends on us collectively raising expectations and realizing it's on us. Um, so you might say, well, is this eviction gonna happen? And I can say, honestly, and in good faith, no. And it's because I know it's on me collectively with other people, we could simply shut down the courtroom or something like that. And then it makes it true. Um, and I've been, there's not a real question here. I've just been thinking about these issues for a while. Um, kind of the self-fulfilling nature of it, the way that structural change is really dependent on collective, but also individual expectations for the future, the sense that we think it's on us or up to us when we're making these long-term plans. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, that's really helpful um, because um, one of the things I've been kind of um, banging my head against the wall about is, exactly how much to concede to the individual ways of framing the question of freedom that I'm responding to or individualist maybe, um, because that's actually the version of, that's actually the scale that I'm interested in, right? You know, I, I don't think, you know, I mean, presumably somebody who is in solitary confinement could, you know, meditate on their locus of control and do some psychological things that are positive for them. And people, in fact, do do that, right? So I'm not trying to put that aside at all or say it's impossible. But what I am interested in is, you know, what is it that the Vietnam War veterans Herman is talking about as a group end up doing? What is it that the eviction defense team ends up doing as a group? Um, and cultivating the sense that um, the political structure and the practical structure besides the political structure that we live in is something alterable by us. Um, that is something um, extremely important to not just subjective security, not just feeling like you're free, but but actually developing the power that it would take to be free, right? And that's eventually where I want to get to. Um, so, so it's helpful that you put it that way because I don't think I had been able to say it as clearly as you said just now, but I'll definitely, you know, think in that direction. Thank you so much for your very uh, compelling talk. So I wanted to ask you also on, on the concept and idea of freedom, uh, because we, you have been mentioning several times um, 
these aspects, material aspects, social structure. So I wanted to ask you whether when you were thinking about freedom, you consider certain systems or communities or we could say political entities that provide certain conditions that can facilitate that an individual can be free. And also think material aspects can be human rights, you know, liberties. This is more political, you know, but I wanted to, to listen to your point of view. And also at the same time, uh, well, I'm very fascinated with all the different ideas and examples. Uh, when you were talking about freedom as, as self-determination, um, this capacity to pursue the course of our own lives, um, I was just thinking that even in the more idealistic uh, society, um, there's not absolute freedom because we always have to comply with certain rules, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, taxes, this, that, you know, we, if we live in a community, I mean, we have to respect, you know, not making noise. So how do you, if, if for you, like this idea of freedom from an individual or aspect and also ethical point of view has to do more with uh, the possibility to make decisions, to have opportunities, because absolute freedom I don't think it is six, but that's something that I wanted to hear from you as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those questions. Um, so, uh, yes, um, there, there's definitely a thought about um, what kinds of social structures would fit this view of freedom. And surprise, surprise, it's going to be socialism. Um, but um but but i am but but i think a commitment to that ends up being ends up constraining political institutions maybe uh less than some others at least some other socialists and certainly anti socialists i guess uh, um it it would end up constraining which political structures could potentially be compatible with freedom, I think less than some people might guess. There might be a lot of ways of organizing the world that are compatible with freedom. I think they would involve, you know, socializing the means of production. Um, but I think that's, a, I think a lot of other ways of organizing politics end up being compatible with that. So one of the things in particular that I'm thinking a lot about in developing this is uh, the history of Maroon communities, people who fled slavery and set up alternative societies. Um, and, you know, the, and broadly secessionist movements, um, 1700 to present. And I think there's, it turns out that not just theoretically, but in actuality, there's a lot of um, interesting political structures that you could fit under, you know, that you could potentially fit under a broad ethos of um, sharing how it is that we produce things. And I think the reason for that flexibility ties into the second question that you asked. Um, should we think that absolute freedom is possible? Um, or should we accept that there have to be limits to freedom? And I certainly think that there have to be limits to freedom in the sense that um, I don't think a free society in my sense is a society where any person can take any action or will or, you know, or pursue any end that occurs to them, right? Um, but I don't actually, you know, in a way, part of what I'm trying to reject in developing this view of freedom is a kind of American supermarket way of thinking about freedom, where like freedom is being able to go to a store of ends and pick out the brand that fits your, you know, pick out the particular kind of action that fits how you think and how you identify and what you want. Um, I don't think. I think freedom and choice are related, but are tied together maybe too tightly in some philosophical traditions. I think um, one of the things that's compelling about Carolina Maria de Jesus's example is this is a 
story of unfreedom entirely built through the choices that she makes. And you don't even get to seeing the unfreedom until you explain what's behind those choices. Um, yeah, so I don't, so it's consequential that I think freedom is, comes down to self-determination view. And the self-determination view is not um, you having some particular list of choices or particular freedoms to do this or that, be they vote in an election or um, choose from different options at a grocery store. Um, but what freedom comes to on this view is how we understand the choices that you do make. Um, so do we understand your exercise of your agential capacities as um, producing activities that is producing activity that is yours in the relevant sense, or simply producing activity that is done by you, which, you know, even the person pointing a gun at you can't remove from you, right? Um, so apologies, that was a little bit of a rambling answer, but hopefully I got to um, your questions a bit. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your brilliant presentation and to share your new ideas with us. And I'm happy to, to, hear, to hear about uh, Carolina Maria de Jesus here in a philosophical talk. And um, yes, you um, you choose uh, bring two big problems together: um, subjectivity and security. Mm. So, uh, if you start with subjectivity, uh, I'd like to bring to talk with you Fanon, uh, special black skin, white masks, uh, which he put the, the ontological, the being black as an ontolo ontological failure. And uh, when we, if, we, are, if we, we agree that we live in a racial capitalism, so we need to think what is, subjectivity uh, considering what is being black and uh, yes I think that's not a question but um, at a point what I, what I mean is um, if you want to think about freedom uh, we need to think about how to uh, how to make the race disappear to create a, a one level onto, a one ontological level what means how human being means this is the point and uh, and the other and um, it's about security so if we live in a society, in a system that produces precarity, uh, the security, it's a kind of privilege. So who has this privilege? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this, this uh, topic that is, that is very important today, that is the um, uh, racism on over environmental racism. Mm -hmm. So who is affected uh, by the consequences of the exploitation of the, the um, uh, climate changes? So we know who, who, who are these, these people. So the system, uh, Continues, continues producing uh, since ever <laughs> uh, the conditions of precarity and non uh, and not um, security. So this is another another point. It's not the questions. It's just uh, trying to to think together. 
Yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing those up. I think there's a strong relationship between the two points, at least um, in my thinking. Um, so one of the things uh, I skipped past is um, thinking about um, subjective precarity, um, which you could think of as just the absence of security, if you wanted. Um, but I think it is helpful to think about precarity itself because of what you said, right? Precarity is produced. And the way that I understand racial capitalism um, in connection to security um, is that it's built on what I call, um, let me put it this way. The way security is produced in racial capitalism is built according to a strategy of antagonistic security. So security is taken from some people and given to other people. Um, that's particularly important in the Labar example, right? Why does this French colonist believe that he is safe? He believes he is safe because of particular ways that the world has been made unsafe for the people who, are, who were enslaved in Saint-Domingue, the people who were enslaved in Haiti. Um, it was made unsafe for them by, uh, you know, the terror of the racial regime in Saint-Domingue by surveillance of enslaved people, by the high and unsurvivable work rates, all the things that made life difficult to survive and made rebellion different, difficult to organize for um, enslaved Africans in Saint-Domingue. Those are the very things that made Labar feel that he was safe. So security was kind of stolen from the enslaved Africans along with many other things that were stolen from them um, to give to Labar. And I think in perhaps less dramatic ways, that's what police departments do now and not just in the United States, obviously, in many places in the world. Um, I think this is what the police do in Nigeria, in Brazil, et cetera. Um, I think that's what the institution of policing is for. I think it's an example of an institution that plays this antagonistic security function. Um, and the reason why I think your second point ties to the first point is because I want to say, um, apologies if there are Afro pessimists in the room, but you know, I, I it's it's nothing like insulting, but but there is a there are a group of people who are trying to take up Fanon and take up in particular the kinds of claims Fanon makes at the ontological level, right? That blackness is a zone of non-being, right? It's ontological failure. Um, it's um, not existing in the world as this rational agent that lots of analytic philosophy talks about. I think there's some truth to that, but I think there's a way of taking that up that sort of mystifies it, right? That ontologizes the ontological failure that is because you're black and not because of any particular things happening in the world beyond the fact of your blackness that you exist in the zone of non-being. Um, I think that's one way to take it up. We can argue about whether or not that's an accurate description of Afro-pessimist thought. Um, but I think there are very specific social institutions and social activities that in fact make it the case that Blackness has something to do with this zone of non-being. And I think the slave patrols were an example. Police institutions, policing institutions are an example. There are particular things that happen in our society that makes it true that somebody like Carolina Maria G. Jesus has to fish through the trash to get her daughter a birthday present. Like that is not a mystical fact about the world, that is an explainable fact about the world. And that is something about the world that we could change to produce a world with one ontological level where everyone was 
um, everyone had the freedom to self-determine and not just to the kind of people who are like Labar, but everyone. Um, and yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Sydney. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so I wanted to talk, yeah, I want to talk more about um, climate change um, and um, talk about freedom and control. So um, Nietzsche actually talks a lot about um, this human desire for freedom and control and like will of nature. And we have this balance between being a part of nature, being a part of the material world and desiring to control it, to like show our dominance that we are free and we can will what we want out of it. And so when we think about this idea of climate change in context with your, um, with your work here is that, you know, it's going to start limiting our freedom, climate. And so what I'm thinking is good because, <laughs> because our, our will of nature, our, our need for this freedom, for this like control seems to be what caused this climate change. Our like separation from the material world to say we're something separate from nature. We don't acknowledge ourselves as a part of nature. So we, we think we can take from it all we want. And now nature has come back to say, actually, I'm in control of this planet. So it just seems, I don't know, it's interesting to think about this illusion of freedom when it comes down to it. None of us can really do anything about a tsunami, you know, as much as we think science is not there. It's clearly not there. We can't even predict the weather. So maybe lack of freedom is good in that aspect. But then of course we, what <laughs> Mafia just brought up is like, well, who's, who's real lack of freedom. Okay. Now we're talking about, you know, <laughs> third world countries and Brown people. Um, so it's not going to be really the white industrial Kings that are going to be suffering. So I don't know. I don't know. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, this is, this is interesting because, um, you know, I think, I think part of the setup resonates with me, um, which is that I do think we need to get rid of um, the idea that um, the world in general or everything that happens to us is in principle the kind of thing that we could control. I do think that there's a hubris there um, and that has to go. Um, and it has to go not just from capitalist thought, um, but it also has to go from materialist thought. And I think it works a little more subtly on the left side of things, but it's also there. Um, but um, so, so I, that resonates with me. Um, but of course, as you brought up, you know, the people who um, perhaps are, are most guilty of this sort of thinking aren't necessarily the people who will be worst hurt by the, you know, climate impacts. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe more importantly, I think, um, I think that this thinking is more symptom than cause of the climate crisis. Like at, at bottom, you know, it is, um, the orientation of production around capital accumulations and contingent things about the kind of energy system that we have built in order to accumulate capital that explains why we emit at the rate that we do, um, why we have made the, why land use is distributed in the way that it is. Like, I, I think these things, you know, I think the social structural explanation of these things um, includes stuff about how we think, but it also includes um, stuff about how people thought 100 years ago in particular parts of the planet, which might have been very different. Um, it includes a lot of people guessing about what other people's supercomputers will think five seconds from now. Um, and there's there's a lot of stuff happening beyond, um, I don't want to say beyond ideology, but um, perhaps um, there are a lot of things happening that aren't really exhausted by ideology. And I don't necessarily think those things would change just by us getting a bit more humble 
Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't, for a variety of reasons, including those two, I don't think that climate imp there's much to cheer for in climate impacts, you know. Yeah. So um, I like the subjective security um, idea, but um, I don't know why you, you uh, liked Isaiah Berlin's essay, uh, because his specific point is that he separates out liberty, as he puts it, from its conditions. And clearly you want to see freedom as access to conditions, I think in this, uh, to some degree, presupposing it at least by way of a necessary aspect of it. That's just a comment. But when one uh, looks at it that way, um, perhaps you're building into the idea of self-determination what I would see as another aspect of the positive freedom idea, freedom too. Normally, one would think that self-determination just is a kind of relatively static, reproducible feature. So in that sense, it seems to share the liberal emphasis on free choice as just something that we always have and we always exercise and we can be you know, restrained from doing so, but it's just always the same over time. And what, what's, what uh, some of us in the positive freedom tradition argue is that what you need in addition is a developmental notion of freedom over the course of a life. And perhaps you're getting to this in your idea of biography, the biography part of autobiography, but that it has a narrative aspect and that it involves the uh, possibilities of developing capacities interrelating with others uh, in ways that one is self-determining about in a way. But that just to say that there's a process of self-determination, um, I'm not sure that that you know what what you want to build into that whether it also includes this these ideas of the developmental aspect uh growth and development over time or you know whatever um uh that a lot of us would think are required in addition to the self determination the other just aspect of that that i think requires a, i'd like to hear more clarity on is how you can get away from the idea of choice altogether clearly we don't want to see it as a consumer choice thing but the person who is impoverished has a very constrained set of choices and cannot develop themselves, cannot develop capacity to interact with others because they're spending all the time scrounging for food for their family. So, you know, isn't, doesn't that involve some element of, um, don't you need to keep some element of choice in the idea of self-determination? Or how do you in, interpret it so that, so those two questions, one about self-determination, one about development. I actually have a second question. Maybe I should hold it till you answer this. But the second question is about the political. I, I agree that it's not indifferent about political economy, but I think that the socialism that you, uh, that you have to have would be a democratic socialism be, for the following reason, that the, this freedom is a freedom of each. So it involves some idea of equality, at least in respect of each person having a capacity to be to exercise their freedom or this self-determination. So it applies to everyone. And the interpretation of that in a political context would, in my reading, have to necessarily be a democratic one because they would each have a right to co-determine their collectivity together. Um, and that each would have to have an equal right to do so because no one would have more of a right than others to determine themselves in the context of the collective self-determination process. So that's why I think that it would require not democracy the way we see it as just voting and, uh, um, and you know, majority rule, but some form of egalitarian decision-making in which the self-determination is has to be participatory because you said, for example, this is the last comment that you're looking at the self-determination of a collective as analogous to that of an individual, but you could have a, a self-determining collective that squashed the self-determination possibilities of individuals, unless it was a democratic one in which they had an equal right to participate in shaping their collectivity. So that's a bunch of questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll try to, I'll try to, um, get to all of them. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start at the end. Uh, I'm not, 
you know, I'm not invested in the term democratic socialism, uh, mostly because I don't know what it means. Um, and and I also, you know, the the points that the substantive points that you made about having to have an element of participation and uh, freedom of each um, are fundamental to how I understand socialism. And I understand that that's not that that doesn't generalize to everybody who's talked about socialism, but that's I'm just saying um, what I understand to be going on. Um, but I, I would certainly agree that there are ways of you know, there are kinds of there are kinds of vanguardism, for instance, um, that might run over genuine participatory decision making, and that's not the team I would play for. Um, and I think there's, yeah, I so I agree with the substance of the point. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I would use the term democratic socialism to frame it, but uh, yeah. Um, let's see. I also think that um, the other questions, let's see, which should I go to? Develop, development over a lifetime. Yeah, so, and and the contrast to a, a sort of the, the positive freedom to school. Um, so I, I think in, you know, I think with most of these on the screen right now, um, there's ways of interpreting them widely that they might, run into at least one of the others, if not all of the others. Um, I certainly think there's a conception of positive liberty that would be very friendly to how I think of the views, um, how I think of freedom. Um, in particular, the processual view of action that I want, especially at the scale of your human lifetime, is entirely because I agree with this point that you're bringing up. I think developing capacities um, at the level of a person is important for making out what freedom looks like over a lifetime, and that's the right time scale to ask if we're talking about individuals. Um, but I don't think, I think maybe just as important is the kind of intergenerational time scale of human action. That's not something that I see as often um, stressed on the side of um, some of the folks in the positive liberty literature, um, but it's the kind of thing that I'm thinking on the political side of freedom of self as self-determination view is very strongly emphasized um, on the, on the, you know, the examples I have are post-colonial states um, and indigenous nations, um, lots of which have heavy emphasis on intergenerational politics and creating the conditions for lifetime scale self moral and political development of our children and our children's children and our children's children's children um and i think those kinds of decisions you know not to make me sound like a long termist or whatever um but but that scale of decision making is critical for um the view of freedom that i have um and it's part of why the view of freedom that i have ends up being ecological what we should what we should adopt as goals as political goals are changes to the sort of practical ecology what stuff is around um what institutions are around for the next generation what things um what affordances are built into our literal and political environment for the people that come after us. Those are um, things we end up having to target on a freedom of self-determination view. And I think many people in the positive freedom literature would agree, but maybe just a difference in emphasis. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's cool. Uh, just uh, one, could you comment on the choice question to clarify that also? That's my bad. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 certainly, I certainly don't mean to say that choice is uh irrelevant i i think um yeah i don't mean to say that choice is irrelevant i don't know if it's actually true that marginalized people have are constrained in a kind of crass numerical sense of constraint right it may be that there are 20 ways to live a marginalized life and 18 ways to live a ruling class life, right? Um, I think this is, this is actually something 
uh, Tommy Shelby makes a good point of in uh, Dark Ghettos, um, there are actually just qualitatively different kinds of decisions and different kinds of lives people can choose to live on the basis of being marginalized. And I don't, choice doesn't seem to be, the absence or presence of choices, um, let me, let me put it this way. Um, once we've identified the particular domains of choice where we're ready to call a marginalized person's choice set constrained relative to a privileged or advantaged person's choice set, once we've identified that domain of activity, we've already done the work to say what's important about freedom. Like if it, if it turns out that voting in an election or opening a 401k or whatever, like if, if those are the possible choices that have to be available to you to be free, um, then it turns out that our vision of freedom is about those particular activities. And the, the word choice doesn't seem to be doing much work at that point for me. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying that I think it's the content of what people have to choose from. And much more importantly than that, how people are in a position to understand what they're choosing any particular option would even be in the kind of final analysis. Um, I think those, I, I think that's what matters, you know, like suppose you wake up and you're enslaved and the master gives you 37 different colored chains to decide whether or not you decide which to wear, right? Like, is that an expansion of my freedom if I can choose the green ones to match my shoes? You know, I don't think so, right? Um, I, obviously that's a caricatured example, but I just don't, I'm extremely suspicious about the work that Choice is doing in these debates. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I want to think with you a little bit about dependence and interdependence, because as far as I understood it, you set up the problem of security and subjective security and freedom, thinking about the problem of other people and specifying that that problem of other people can be contingent or it could be um, more internal. Um, the relations that I have with others um, frustrate my ends because you, you the satisfaction of your ends means the frustration of mine. You brought up domination, et cetera. And then in the PTSD example, one of the elements that realizes subjective security in a non-ideal way, I love that by the way, non-ideal subjective security, is being in community, being in relation, also the whole autobiographical aspect and narrative and part of what Jordan brought up at the beginning, this like story that we tell ourselves in a collective that we can win, um, that's also involves others in that act of storytelling. It's not something you can really do yourself. And I think that was part of what was you were bringing out with this um, person in solitary confinement and trying to find that locus of control within themselves. Um, so there seems to be this very positive role for interdependence. And I was even thinking maybe the term is intersubjective security. There is this, it's, it's like a very, and, and maybe this is a way to sort of mediate the, the struggle of like the, the, the importance of the individual in your account. The individual is what we're interested in, sure, but the individual is sort of deeply intermeshed with others in ways that you know, we can tell like the hermeneutical story, we can tell the like material story, we can tell the social reproduction story. Um, I just think that that is, is sort of undergirding the account and I'm wondering what you have to say about it. I like that a lot. I might have to, I might have to steal that. And by steal that, I mean, use insight. But, um, but, but yeah, inner subjective security really is a much better match um, for how I'm thinking of this um, because I don't really think, you know, I don't really think the individual scale is even intelligible um, because, you know, uh, you can't really tell 
the story of what individual choice making even means, except in ways that kind of presuppose collectivity. Um, may, you know, maybe that's the fictive story. Maybe I just buy that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what I want out of um, talking about, you know, quote unquote individual level um, or maybe inner subjective security is um, I think the thing that you're picking up on, which is not only do, do other accounts not um, solve the problem of other people in the right way, you know, maybe the, the more fundamental thing is that they treat other people as the problem, as for a problem, as a problem, right? But other people turn out to be the solution. It's because, you know, it's because there are other people that these kinds of, these deep kinds of freedom that I'm talking about, including autobiography, even become available. Um, and, you know, it's the solution of other people is really how we should think about it. Um, you know, yeah, that's the story I want to tell at the end of the day. I have to think a little bit about um, the best way to tell that story, um, but that's definitely the story. So, Swan, and not to force a showdown between you and Carol, um, <laughs> but one question is just to what extent we can, do you think we can think of these kinds of additional notions of security as the conditions that positive freedom theorists uh, have emphasized, right? The, the, what Rawls might also call the things that conduce to the fair value of certain liberties and freedoms, right? Background conditions of freedom. Just why not, why not say this is a positive liberty view? What is the real thing that you want to reject there is just one question. And the second question, though, it's more touched on this a little bit, but um, second question I'd want to hear something um, newer about, which is like the ideological function of freedom talk that we're all aware of, right? Like, so of course, positive freedom philosophers, right? Great. Um, but there's also this worry that we live in a culture where like, Freedom has all of this cachet in opposition to things like equality or duty or responsibility or solidarity or community. So I was just wondering like how you think about that as someone kind of putting forward this kind of freedom first kind of project. How do you think about the kind of trade-offs in emphasizing this concept, which is often, even if, even if in actuality we can draw fine distinctions between freedom and other concepts like equality or solidarity, how do you think about the real world impact of sort of focusing on this notion when there are these ideological potential costs? One of the basic things that I think, um, and you know, it's a little bit topsy-turvy, maybe even contradictory, but there's a kind of practical danger in being too practical. Um, and I, I'm gonna try to explain the thought there, but. The thing I'm trying to say is you can make all of political thought subject to these kinds of um, to these the kinds of gamesmanship that you have to do living in society with with other problematic people. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you can make everything subject to trying to be careful about the unfair and potentially harmful and potentially dishonest ways that other people might use the things that you're saying. Um, but I think if you do that, you're never going to get around to figuring out what you yourself actually want and what it is that you can achieve, or you're you're never going to do that in the fullest way. So it is it is self defeating. Actually, is is the argument that I'm trying to make. I think it's it's self defeating to be overly responsive to the kind of practical context. I don't think you should ignore it entirely. Um, but you know, I I do think that when I'm, you know. Hopefully, you know, spaces like this at, you know, CUNY Graduate Center at uh, other places of learning um, can be spaces where we just try to work out what the good accounts are and what the true accounts are and those kinds of things. Um, and then there's, you know, a kind of separate practical question of 
what stuff we advertise to lar larger audiences and you know what we go on podcasts and TV and flyers and whatnot to say. Um, but but I'm hoping that um, that kind of answer is persuasive because this is actually something um, that I referenced in the reparations book. Uh, Toni Morrison gave a speech where she made this provocative claim that the real function of racism is distraction. And she said in this kind of, of funny way, you know, you know, somebody says that your head is shaped wrong. And so you spend years proving that it isn't. And somebody says you have no kingdoms and you spend years proving that there are. Um, but her jokes aside, like if, you know, I actually spent grad school reading all this stuff, there are entire generations of scholarship whose, you know, entire generations of scholars whose lives were de devoted to, you know, debunking whatever nonsense racist people were saying in those years. Um, and, and I don't think that nobody should do that, but I don't think that, you know, entire fields of scholarship should be defined by, um, or should be so responsive to whatever nonsense, you know, the, you know, whatever nonsense racists are saying in this generation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's the general kind of flavor that I think, I'm not sure what, I, I'm not sure what it's strategic to say about freedom quite yet, um, which is I'm, why well, I'm saying this to you all and um, not, uh, I don't know, out in the public square or whatever, but um, but I, I do think that's a relevant thing to think about. Um, so, yes, uh, sorry, the first question, remind me. Oh, there the were first two. question was, was about what what in particular makes you want to resist casting this as a as a sophisticated refinement of a positive freedom view? Oh, um, I'm not sure I want to resist it. I think you know. I think it fits most squarely into the freedom of self determination self determination view at the bottom here. Um, in particular because of the political history of self-determination as a concept, um, which is has its own complications, but I think is all in all useful. Um, but I think all of these categories, you know, if you squint and turn your head sideways, you know, you could read most of them as most of the others. Um, I, I, I think the difference in emphasis that is maybe what I'm latching onto and why I'm characterizing my view in category number five here, um is the emphasis um on not the doings um but how you characterize the doings right so it's not that um you know freedom doesn't consist um or the important thing for me about freedom isn't the ability to do some particular phi Right, um, or the particular to not be impeded from doing some particular phi, um, or the or even the absence of any particular relation of domination where some particular person might tell me to do phi. Right, what's important about freedom from my point of view is that when I do anything, phi or not phi, it's me. Right, I think that's the th that's that's the thing that's the view that I'm trying to defend, um, and I think that is the thing self-determination is trying to say like figures like cabral are saying it's our history you know we might mess it up but it'll be us messing it up and not the portuguese empire and that's the thing that that's the basis on which we would characterize ourselves as free or not free and i think that's the team i play for at the end of the day please join me in thanking femi taiwo for a fantastic talk thanks everybody Thank you for coming.